Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, with your permission, Presiding Officer, I'd like to begin today with a few brief words about the late Charles Kennedy. Although not a member of this chamber, I know we were all deeply saddened to learn of his passing earlier this week. Charles was a very special human being, a talented and gifted politician, but also a thoroughly decent man. His contribution to Scottish and to UK politics was immense. He will be remembered for many things, not least his opposition to the war in Iraq and for the historic success of his party under his leadership. I know I'll be speaking on behalf of all of us in this chamber when I say that our thoughts are very much with Charles' family, in particular his young son, his friends and, of course, his colleagues on the Liberal Democrat benches. Uh, later today, Presiding Officer, I will have engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Thank you, President Officer. And on behalf of these benches, we share that sadness and the sentiments of the First Minister. Charles Kennedy was undoubtedly a very principled man and a well-loved politician and will be sorely missed in Scottish and British public life. He was also, of course, a, a great European. And earlier this week, the First Minister was in Brussels, rightly making the case for the UK remaining in the European Union. 300,000 Scottish jobs are linked to our EU membership and our education system must equip young Scots with the skills to take advantage of those opportunities. The ability to speak other languages is key for young Scots when competing for jobs across Europe and that's why in 2012 we were proud to support the SNP government when it introduced the 1 plus 2 language initiative. Can the First Minister tell us how that is going? First Minister. Well, I'm happy to ask the Education Secretary to write to the member to give her a full progress report on uh, the developments on the 1 plus 2 language programme because it is an important issue to raise. Can I say uh, generally, and I hope it's something that we will be able to strike uh, some agreement across the Chamber on, that firstly, traditionally in Scotland and indeed across the UK, we have not been as good as we should be in learning modern languages. And many other countries across the continent have put us to shame in that respect. But secondly, it is important that we equip uh, our young people with the ability to compete in the modern world. And that does include, it is not exclusively about, but it does include the ability to speak modern languages. One of the discussions I was having in Europe uh, on uh, Tuesday of this week was about uh, the changes in terms of uh, the increase in the speaking of some modern languages, Spanish, for example, overtaking German uh, and French now. So we must make sure that our curriculum is keeping up with that so that we are equipping our young people. Uh, can I say lastly on the issue of European Union uh, membership, uh, I was making the case for Scotland's continuing membership in Brussels on Tuesday. I was also making the point that it was it would be unacceptable for Scotland to be taken out of the European Union against our will. Uh, the Labour First Minister of Wales, Carwyn Jones, agreed with me on that point yesterday. I hope Kezia Dugdale will take the opportunity to do so as well today. Kezia Dugdale. Mr. Officer, I very much look forward to working with the First Minister in terms of making the positive case for Europe and our place in it. I asked specifically about European languages and the reality is that it's not going very well at all. A paper published by Dr James Scott is in the current Scottish Languages Review has the evidence and Dr Scott's published research shows that in the first year of the new national exams the number of pupils sitting French and German fell by 37 per cent. The numbers passing fell by more than 40 per cent almost half. That's appalling, presiding officer. A 40% drop in S4 pupils getting a qualification in one of the key European languages. And it's not just Europe either. In 2012, to great fanfare, the SNP government set a target of doubling the number of school students gaining qualifications in the Chinese language. Can the First Minister tell us how that is going? First Minister. I will look very carefully at the research that Kezia Dugdale has cited today and I'll do that for two reasons. Uh, firstly, because it's important that I do that, uh, because it's important that we look carefully and follow the lessons of any research that's published. But the second reason I will do that is the last time Kezia Dugdale quoted research uh, to me at First Minister's questions about exam passes, she mixed up, I assume inadvertently, entries for exams and the number of candidates sitting exams. And what 
course, you will know is that one of the express objectives of Curriculum for Excellence was to reduce the number of subjects that candidates sit at exam level. So I will study very carefully the research that she cites. Now, I said in my initial answer that it's important that we do continue to make progress around modern languages. It's important that we do that in order that our young people are passing exams in modern languages. But it's also important that we start earlier. One of the objectives of Curriculum for Excellence is to make sure that we are equipping our young people, not waiting to secondary school to do that, but to start in primary school for the range of challenges they meet in the modern world. So as a government, we are determined that we continue to do that. Uh, we're determined that we do that for the language that traditionally it's been important to speak, but also increasingly for the languages in future, it's important to speak like Chinese. And I would hope that we would get support across the chamber as we continue to focus exactly on these matters. Keza Dugdale. President, also, the First Minister suggested that I had misrepresented the work of Dr James Scott. I'm afraid that's not the case and she should uh, phone, her, phone him herself if she'd like to check that. I spoke to Dr James Scott again this morning and the numbers that I'm using today are accurate and are in his published paper which is actually funded by the Scottish Government. So they should be very careful with how they present what I'm saying. President Officer, what the First Minister can't quite bring herself to say is that there's been no progress made at all. In fact, things are getting worse. The number of candidates sitting the new Chinese national exam fell by over a third last year. And what's worse is that the number of young Scots who passed that exam has dropped by 42%. So we know the SNP government is failing when it comes to European languages, and we know Scotland is going backwards when it comes to Chinese. Hopefully, the SNP government would be doing better when it comes to Gaelic. So can the First Minister tell us whether the number of Gaelic learners gaining level three, four, five qualifications went up or down last year? First Minister. First Minister. In, um, in respect of the research by uh, Dr Jim Scott, and I you know, will look at uh, the figures that Kezia Dugdale is citing today, but I, I think it's important to stress this point to the Chamber. The last time uh, that Kezia Dugdale cited the research of Dr Jim Scott, she said that that research showed that the number of candidates gaining level three to five qualifications was down by almost 102,000. Actually, at all levels, there are only round about 150,000 candidates in every year. She mixed up, she confused the number of candidates with the number of entries, because candidates, of course, are presented for multiple exams. So that is the reason why uh, I will have a degree of scepticism. Now, Order! Kezia Dugdale Order. is raising an important issue, and that's why I'm going to treat the issue seriously. It is important that we ensure that young people are equipped with the skills they need to compete in the modern economy. That's why, through our attainment challenge, we're putting such a focus on literacy and numeracy and health and well-being. It is why it is important also to focus on exams and skills and knowledge in modern languages. That is exactly why the new Curriculum for Excellence uh, curriculum has been introduced. It's why we've got the new national exam system in place. That's the foundation uh, on which we are now building to ensure that we focus on areas where we need improvement to equip our young people for the future. We will continue to focus on doing that, presiding officer. And you know, I would say to Kezia Dugdale, I noticed, um, I noticed that her rival for the leadership uh, of the Labour Party, I don't know if he's in the chamber, said yesterday that he found that the continual SNP bashing of the Labour Party was making him begin to despair. I think today he'll be finding it hard not to put his head in his hands. Kezia Dugdale. Ms Dugdale. President Officer, I'm here asking what's happening in our schools and the First Minister is here asking what's happening in the Scottish Labour Party. Doesn't that say it all? So here's the answer. In the first year of the new national exams, the number of Gaelic learners fell by 21%. And the number of pupils who passed that fell by more than a quarter. Dr Scott's analysis describes the decline in Gaelic under the SNP as significant, given all the money that has been invested in this area. In a lecture based on his paper, he expressed fears for some modern languages disappearing from our schools altogether. 
Teachers and head teachers have warned ministers of chaos with the new exams. I have repeatedly raised problems with the new exams. Thousands of pupils have signed a petition telling ministers there's a problem with the new exams. And as we speak, EIS are in Perth deciding on whether to boycott the new exams altogether. After more than eight years in government, presiding officer, when is the first minister going to take her head out of the sand and clean up this mess? First minister. Firstly, First I, I assume that wasn't Kezia Dugdale endorsing a boycott of the new exams. I, I certainly hope she'll clarify uh, that matter. Secondly, there has been an issue raised. Kezia, Kezia Dugdale raised it last week, an issue of concern with the higher maths exam. The uh, feeling on the part of many students, uh, understandably so, that that exam uh, was too difficult in terms of uh, how they had been taught for that. I gave a lengthy and detailed explanation last week of how the Scottish Qualifications Authority deal with those situations to make sure that no young person is disadvantaged because of that. But to Make a leap from that, as Kezia Dugdale has just done, to describe the new exam system as being in chaos, presiding officer, I think is deeply, deeply irresponsible. And does a great, and does a great disservice to young people and to teachers across our country who are working so hard for those exams. Now, to come back to the point about languages. I will, as I said uh, in my first answer to Kezia Dugdale, study carefully the figures she cited to me today. I will be particularly looking to see, and I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt, to say that this is not what she's done, that the, she hasn't made the same mix-up as she made the last time between candidates and numbers of entries. But can I say finally, presiding officer, as First Minister, as leader of this government, uh, we will continue to focus on making sure that we have an education system that is providing the education, the skills and the training that our young people need. We will not be diverted from that objective. That is our responsibility. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to add the sympathies of myself and of my party to those expressed by others here today on the death of Charles Kennedy. Our thoughts and prayers are with his son Donald and with the wider Kennedy family. I'd also like to ask the First Minister when she will next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, I have no plans in the near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presenting officer, staff working in Scotland's NHS are under pressure like never before. More patients are coming through the doors and the cracks are beginning to show in hospitals across the country. This week, the NHS workforce statistics were published and they uncovered staff sickness levels across Scotland at a seven-year high. Worst affected is the Scottish Ambulance Service, where more than 7% of staff are off at any one time. That is four times the average sickness rate outside the public sector. It is clear that health workers are struggling to cope in an increasingly strained environment, and the figures show that the problem is getting worse. What will the First Minister do to help? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I take the opportunity to, uh, as I always do uh, when talking about the NHS, to thank NHS staff working right across the country to deliver quality health services for people in every part of our country. Uh, making sure that we keep levels of sickness absence in the NHS to a minimum has always been and was all through the time I was health secretary a key priority for uh, health boards and uh, trade unions within the health service work very hard with health boards uh, to try to support staff to do that. The specific question Ruth Davidson asked me was what do we as government do to help? Well, I think perhaps the most important thing we have done as a government is to ensure that the number of people working in our health service to deal with the rising demand for health services because of our ageing population is increasing. So the statistics that were published on Tuesday that Ruth Davidson has quoted from also showed that there are now 10,500 more people working in our NHS than was the case when this government took office. So we will continue to ensure record funding of our health service. We will continue to ensure that there are record staffing numbers in our health service. And it's because of that that we have a health service now that is delivering historically low waiting times. And that's a credit actually not to this government. That is a credit to the staff who are working so hard to achieve it. Ruth Davidson. Well, I thank the First Minister for her reply, but the fact is that this week's figures, published by her government, only show part of the picture, and despite her answer, staff shortages are a real issue. In fact, 
The Scottish Conservatives wrote to NHS boards across the country to ask how often staffing concerns had been formally raised by doctors and nurses, and the answer was in their thousands. In Dumfries and Galloway alone, just in the last year, there have been 4,000 separate incidents of staff saying there weren't enough people to do the job. Doctors and nurses so worried about patient care that they formally raised this with their managers. So it's no wonder that staff's sickness levels are on the rise. Here's two things that the Scottish Conservatives would do to help. We will hire a thousand more frontline nurses and midwives by asking people who can afford it to pay a contribution to the prescriptions. And we also promise to pass on every penny of the extra health money that is coming to Scotland as a result of UK government decisions, which is £800 million by 2020. Can the First Minister right here, right now, commit to both of these things? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Firstly, we have protected the revenue budget of the health service and we have already, and I gave this commitment last year, we will continue to protect the revenue budget of the health service each and every year of the next parliament if this government is re-elected. Now, I, firstly, any member of staff in the health service who has concerns about any aspect of the delivery of health care is right to raise that with health managers and health managers have a duty to respond and to address those concerns. I think that's the first important point to make. But Ruth Davidson mentioned uh, Dumfries and Galloway NHS. Let me just give her some of the figures about staffing and staffing increases in NHS Dumfries and Gallery uh, between September 2006 and March 2015, all staff up 6.3%, consultants up 21.9%, emergency medicine consultants up 407%, qualified nurses and midwives up 3.6%, allied health professionals up 16.2%. So that is the increase in staff numbers. Does that mean that I believe our staff are not working under pressure? Of course it doesn't, because we also have rising demand because of the changing demographics of our country. That's why it is so important that I give the commitment as First Minister to continue to protect the health budget. It's why it's so important that I continue to give the commitment to continue to support staff and ensure that staffing numbers increase. It's why we welcomed, as we do so positively, the report from the Royal Colleges and the RCN today. Uh, incidentally, at its last sentence, calling on politicians to stop political point scoring on the NHS and actually come together to make sure that we support our NHS in meeting the challenges of the future. I intend to do that. These benches intend to do that. I hope others make that choice too. Constituency question, John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government can provide to Airdrie Savings Bank and its employees, given its recent decision to close half of its branches, one of which is in my constituency and with whom I bank. First Minister. Um, well, I was uh, obviously concerned to learn of developments in relation to Airdrie Savings Bank and the impact this will have on the employees affected, their families and, of course, customers. I understand that the bank is seeking to modernise its service delivery and develop a long-term business model to allow its approach of community-based banking to continue. Uh, I can confirm that we are working with the bank to support its long-term business model and that through the Financial Sector Jobs Task Force, together with PACE, we will offer all possible support to any staff affected by this announcement. Uh, Airdrie Savings Bank has assured us that they will continue to offer services to all customers whose branches will close and appropriate arrangements will be made to enable customers to access their accounts. Mike McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the importance of the onshore wind sector to the economy of the Highlands and Islands. It is therefore very concerning that the UK Government plan to end onshore wind farm subsidies. Does the First Minister agree with me at the very least the Scottish Government and this Parliament should be consulted on the UK Government's wrong-headed plans? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Uh, yes. I do agree with that, and I'm rather dismayed to hear a member of the Conservative Party, I think, say no, that we shouldn't be consulted on these matters. Um, it is very concerning that changes to UK energy policy are coming out in a piecemeal way via the media instead of through proper engagement with this government and indeed with this parliament and with the energy industry. 
Onshore wind built in the right places has an important role to play in helping to keep the lights on across these islands and it can do so at a competitive cost to consumers. Indeed, it can do so at a cheaper cost than the UK Government's plans for new nuclear power. So I urge the UK Government to engage constructively on this issue and not to turn its back on a key industry. Question three, Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. Can I firstly thank Nicola Sturgeon, Kezia Dugdale and Ruth Davidson for their very generous remarks uh, about my late colleague, uh, friend and fellow Liberal Charles Kennedy, and to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on reports that teachers are working 11 hours each week on top of their contracted hours. First Minister. Well, teachers uh, in Scotland are hard-working professionals and they always go the extra mile for the good of our young people and I, and we all should thank them for that. However, we don't want to see unacceptable burdens placed on them. That's why we're safeguarding posts for the next year by providing £51 million in funding to maintain teacher numbers. That will ensure that we continue to meet our aim of having the right number of teachers with the right skills in all of our schools. We're also working closely with uh, teachers' representatives, including the EIS, local authorities and other partners, to ensure that teacher workload is balanced, and that will include taking forward the recommendations of the ministerial-led working group in tackling bureaucracy, which identifies some specific areas where changes need to be made. Liam MacArthur. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? The EIS survey found that fewer than one in ten teachers are satisfied with their workload. Only a third would recommend teaching as a career. With class size promises not met, teacher numbers down and pupil-teacher ratios up, does the First Minister agree with EIS that scapegoating teachers for a situation that she herself has accepted is not good enough is appropriate? And what specific assurances can the First Minister offer today that things will improve over the next 335 days, given that they have not in the last eight years? First Minister. Well, firstly, I don't believe anybody should seek to scapegoat teachers. I will never do that. This government will never do that. Our teachers do a fantastic job, and all of us should thank them uh, for the work that they do on behalf of our young people. Uh, the fact that we support teachers is evidenced and illustrated by the commitment we made this year, backed by £51 million in funding, to maintain teacher numbers because we recognise the importance of having the right number of teachers with the right skills in all of our schools. Uh, but the issue of workload is an important one. That's why Alistair Allen has been chairing the working group on tackling bureaucracy. Uh, the group's membership includes teachers associations, local authority representative groups, National Parent Forum, uh, Education Scotland and the SQA. It published its first report uh, in November 2013 uh, and made a number of recommendations and its follow-up report was published in March this year and the recommendations there will be taken forward as well. So we will continue to work with teachers to make sure that they are not working under undue workload and that we are tackling bureaucracy but we're also maintaining the number of teachers in our schools to provide excellent education for our children. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. On that point, can I, the First Minister confirm what specific actions are now being progressed following the publication of the report of the working group chaired by the Minister for Learning and Schools on tackling bureaucracy? First Minister. Well, the follow-up report, which was published in March this year, uh, actually was praised by the EIS, and it concluded that progress had been made in tackling bureaucracy, but there was still more that we needed to do. A number of key actions from the report have been taken forward. Uh, for example, Education Scotland working with teacher associations and the Association of Directors of Education to design and deliver workshops, providing practical guidance and good practice examples of what to do to reduce bureaucracy, and that will build on the success of events uh, held last year. Also, the SQA and local authorities are continuing to streamline the verification procedures for the new qualifications. So important work has been done, and we will continue to do that work to make sure that we reduce unnecessary bureaucracy that can be, if we're not careful about it, a burden on our teachers. Question four, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Inclusion Scotland's research suggesting that disabled people are experiencing stress, fear and isolation because of welfare reform. First Minister. Well, this research backs up the findings of the Scottish Government's own welfare tracking study, which was published on Monday of this week. Uh, it found that the UK Government's programme of welfare cuts is negatively affecting some of the most vulnerable people in our society. 
It is completely unacceptable, in my view, that disabled people are finding the process of applying for benefits so difficult and distressing. And of course, all of this is before the further £12 billion of cuts proposed by the UK Government take effect. So the Scottish Government will continue to strongly oppose further cuts to the welfare budget, and we will continue to argue for this Parliament to have responsibility for decisions over Social Security. Yeah. Um, as we have seen from the Inclusion Scotland report, disabled people are already concerned about the cuts and the way they are treated by the DWP's systems and processes. Does the First Minister share my deep concern about the further cuts that are co to come to the Social Security budget and how that will impact on disabled people? Uh, and does she concur that the UK Government must explain and outline which group of people they plan to push into poverty next with their proposed £12 billion of further cuts to the Social Security budget? First Minister. Well, yeah, I do think there is an obligation on the UK government to provide more clarity than they have done about who's going to be hit by the further cut of £12 billion. But actually, what I would much prefer is if the UK government dropped its plans to cut welfare by a further £12 billion. I mean, I very much uh, share the members' concerns that the UK government's austerity agenda is already having a very, very damaging effect on vulnerable people in Scotland. And the lack of clarification about this further cut is important because it increases the anxiety that disabled and vulnerable people already feel. And if you're living with a, a disability, there are already many challenges that you have to overcome in life. You should not have to be living with the worry of a UK government taking a further axe to the benefit that you depend on. So we will continue to oppose these cuts. And as I said in my initial answer, we will continue to argue that the right place for these decisions to be made is not in the Westminster Parliament. It is here in our Scottish Parliament. Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Would the First Minister share my concern that uh, negative attitudes to the unemployed and to the poor are not reserved to Westminster, unfortunately, but all too common amongst our own society? And would she pledge her support for the Stick Your Labels campaign, which aims to tackle stigma and prejudice against the poor and disabled in our country? First Minister. Uh, yes, I would thoroughly uh, endorse uh, that view put forward very constructively by Ken McIntosh uh, there. I think it is important that we challenge uh, negative stigma and uh, negative attitudes. Uh, vulnerable people in our society didn't cause the recession, uh, they didn't cause the deficit, and they don't deserve to pay the price of getting the deficit down. They deserve our support, uh, they deserve our respect, and they deserve a helping hand from all of us, uh, not having their lives made more difficult. So, you know, we've got to challenge those attitudes wherever they exist. I would never stand here and say that there are not those attitudes here in Scotland. And if we all unite and tackle uh, and address uh, and confront those attitudes, then we will be doing a great service to vulnerable people across our country. Alex Johnson. I would be the first to admit that there is fear about benefit changes, but anyone who's been knocking on doors over the past few months will realise that that fear is rather more widespread than the actual experience, particularly in relation to the universal credit, which is only now being introduced on a pilot basis in certain parts of Scotland, and yet has the potential for massive improvement in the conditions of many people who are dependent on benefits. Yet, hostility to the introduction of that scheme is widespread through little experience. First Minister. Well, I, I think if Alec Johnson really thinks that the fears that people have about further benefit cuts are somehow disproportionate to the reality, then he's just pro proven how out of touch uh, he and his party are in Scotland. And I would invite, I would invite openly Alec Johnson to come and knock some doors in my constituency on the south side of Glasgow, come to one of my surgeries where people with mental health problems, people with disabilities, people struggling hard, working hard to support families are at the end of their tether, coming to my office for food bank vouchers because they're living with the consequences of the cuts imposed by the government he supports. So if he's not finding that where he's knocking doors, come and knock doors where I knock doors and he'll find a very different yeah. picture. Question five, Malcolm Chisholm. Um, to ask the First Minister whether it will speak out about human rights abuses in Qatar prior to the Scotland versus Qatar football match tomorrow. First Minister. Well, Scotland has a very strong commitment to securing democracy, the rule of law and fundamental human rights across the world. 
Scottish ministers share the concern of many about the treatment of migrant workers in Qatar, and we condemn human rights abuses in the strongest possible terms. We sought to engage constructively with Qatar on human rights. For example, we have offered to share Scotland's experiences in hosting major sporting events like the Commonwealth Games to help embed human rights and safe working practices into the preparation and staging of the Qatar World Cup. And on that point, I would say one final thing. If the allegations of corruption uh, around uh, the awarding of the World Cup to Qatar are found to be uh, well founded, then there is a very, very strong case for rerunning that competition. Uh, does the First Minister share the widespread concerns in Scotland about the decision of the SFA to arrange uh, this fixture tomorrow? And given that hundreds uh, of workers have already died constructing uh, football stadiums for the 2022 World Cup and that thousands more are facing forced labour and exploitation, will the Scottish Government, all the ministers in the Scottish Government, speak out loudly and clearly against the appalling uh, human rights uh, abuses uh, in Qatar? First Minister, yes, yes, we will do that. Can, can I say I respect the views of those who think tomorrow's match shouldn't go ahead, but I hope those who hold that view will also accept that the other view, that sport can be a good way to engage and highlight human rights abuses, is also a legitimate one, particularly when that alternative view is held by organisations like Amnesty International. Uh, the decision on the match is one for the SFA, and I respect the decision to go ahead with that match just as I respect the decision of any fans who choose not to attend it. But what I would say is this, instead of us in Scotland arguing over one football match, I think we should unite behind these two demands. Firstly, that FIFA gets its house in order, that allegations of corruption are investigated robustly and anyone found guilty is brought to justice. And secondly, that human rights are respected and upheld in every single part of the world without exception. These are the issues that really matter and let us speak with one voice on both of them. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Can the First Minister indicate if there's any coordination or liaison between the Scottish Government and governing bodies that would perhaps make sure that in future there's an established criteria or a policy developed that would stop inappropriate fixtures being agreed in the first instance? First Minister. Well, I I'm happy to explore how these things can be dealt with better so that some of what we are now grappling with can be avoided in future. Many governing bodies, and I believe, although I don't have the particular uh, provision in front of me just now, I believe this includes FIFA, have very strict rules on uh, governments not interfering in the decisions that are taken about uh, sporting events. But there is no doubt what is alleged, uh, and I stress alleged, to have been happening in and around FIFA is appalling. Um, and it is bringing the reputation of a game that so many people across this country and so many people across the world love and adore. It is absolutely essential that those allegations are dealt with, that anybody found guilty is brought to justice and FIFA gets its house in order so that we can all go back to enjoying the wonderful spectacle of sport uh, that we enjoy during World Cups. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I draw the First Minister's attention to the actions of the STUC, who, along with other groups, have campaigned tirelessly to improve workers' rights in Qatar and intend to highlight the issue with fans at tomorrow evening's games? Does the First Minister support the STUC's actions? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. I very strongly support STUC's actions. And it is a way in which... Uh, those who hold the view that sport can be a good way to engage can illustrate that. If a match is taking place, it, as well as being a sporting occasion, provides the opportunity to highlight concerns around human rights abuses or, or other issues of importance. So I think STUC is to be commended for the action that they plan to take tomorrow night, and I'm sure they will have the support not just of me, but of the many fans who will attend that game. Question number six in the name of Stuart McMullen has been withdrawn for understandable reasons, so that ends First Minister's questions. Members who leave in the chamber should leave quickly and quietly.